God. In the name of Jesus, amen. The book of Exodus tells of God's mighty acts of deliverance for his people Israel. It was God who gave and preserved the life of Moses. It was God who called him from the burning bush and sent him as a mouthpiece to Pharaoh. It was God who demanded attention in the ten plagues and finally exerted his power and dominion over the king of Egypt. It was God who was faithful to his people and delivered them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It was God that led them by a pillar of cloud and fire through the Red Sea and on their way to the promised land. Let me be abundantly clear. God had their best interests in mind. God is a God of redemption and salvation. What he started, he was bound and determined to complete. But the people of God made it one chapter out of Egypt and they began to complain. The unleavened cakes they had made were gone. Wandering in the wilderness, food was scarce. So God intervened and sent them their daily manna in the morning and quail in the evening. But the people of Israel were like that delightful childhood story. If you give a mouse a cookie, he'll probably ask for a glass of milk. And so on, and so on, and so on. They had received their daily bread at just the right time, but now in this desert wasteland, they were thirsty, and they accused Moses of murder. Why did you bring us and our children and our livestock out of Egypt? Did you plan to kill us out here? Although they quarreled with Moses, it seemed that God's reputation was on the line. He had delivered them from slavery and oppression, but had he delivered them right into the desert of death? Was his plan to show forth his mighty power only to let his children starve and thirst to death in the wilderness? Of course not. God had their best interests in mind. God is a God of salvation and redemption. What he started, he was bound and determined to complete. So when they arrived at Horeb, he commanded Moses to strike the rock with his staff. The same staff that struck the Nile and turned it to blood. The same staff that parted the Red Sea. God promised to appear when water poured forth from the rock in the presence of the elders of the people. When Moses struck the rock, it poured forth water and they could drink and all were saved. He provided everything they needed, daily bread, water, and the shelter of his covering. He did this out of his abundant goodness and mercy. And yet, through these very necessary and physical means, he led his people to the safety and security of salvation in the promised land and the joy of freedom forever. Too often, we find ourselves in the same position. God claimed us in holy baptism and offers forgiveness to us week in and week out, and yet we are always going back to our old shenanigans. It seems that we can't just shake off our typical behavior and we are unwilling to let God be God. Oftentimes, God has acted in significant ways in your lives and then you can't really be more grateful in those moments. You're excited about the ways he has showed forth his mighty power and his perfect timing. But then comes a challenge. A cross is placed on your back. And rather than following Jesus on the way of suffering and enduring it with patience, we throw it down and shake our fists at God saying, Why now? What purpose is this going to serve? Did you bring me to this point just to kill me? We have issues with the way that God chooses to be God to us. Our hearts are feeble and our trust is always wavering. We can't imagine that anyone else knows what we need or how we should live our life. We lack the faith and the decency of trust to know that God's way is indeed perfect. We want a God who keeps everything in tip-top shape. We want a God who keeps Good Fridays at bay and constantly and only shines resurrection light on every moment of every day. But God is God. 
not you. With unleavened cakes, there really is no need to rely on God for daily bread. But when the food ran out, they had to beg from the Lord's almighty hand and receive their manna with thanksgiving. When the water dried up, they needed God to appear at the rock of Horeb, and once again, he proved himself faithful. When it looked as if God had forsaken the Lord of life on that dark and dreary Good Friday afternoon, he already had his holy angels standing at the ready to move the stone and deliver the breath of life to the lifeless clay of the crucified Savior. There will be moments in this journey of faith when we will pass through the wilderness of sin and stumble our way into Masa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling. But like the old hymn suggests, His grace has brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. In his own way and unique timing, God will grant us a pause in the journey. He might even send us on a more indirect route from point A to point B. You may face an unexpected challenge or a moment of testing. In all likelihood, at one point or another, you will accuse God of bringing you into the wilderness only to kill you. But this God is not a provisional God. He doesn't trust in your weak and temporary faith. He bypasses all your effort and proves his providential power every step of the way. He sees your physical needs and grants them to you every moment of every day. Daily bread, water, and shelter, all of them gifts to be received with thanksgiving. But also he is leading you to the safety and security of salvation in his name. Let me be abundantly clear. God has your best interests in mind. God is a God of redemption and salvation. What he started, he is bound and determined to complete. He has eternity fixed in his sights and he plans to bring you along the way. With God leading the way, not even sin, death, or the devil can get in the way. They couldn't yesterday, they won't today, and they cannot tomorrow. Because nothing... Nothing in all of creation will be able to separate you from his love. Thanks be to God. Amen.